Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I will discuss a clinical scenario of 6 day old male infant who presented to the emergency department with lethargy and grunting respiration. He was born at term after a normal pregnancy to a 35 year old mother after an uncomplicated spontaneous vaginal delivery. His parents state that he has not eaten well over the last day and has been increasingly sleepy. His urine output has been normal until today. Now on examination, he appears pale and mottled with tachypnea and mild retractions. He is lethargic but responds appropriately to painful stimuli. His heart rate is 170 beats per minute and respiratory rate is 80 breaths per minute. Now his lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. You are able to palpate a strong right brachial pulse but cannot palpate femoral pulses. Capillary refill in the legs is very prolonged. Now the four questions. Question number one, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Neonatal sepsis, B. Dehydration, C. Coarctation of the aorta, D. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, E. Transposition of the great arteries. And the correct answer is C, that is coarctation of aorta. This account for 5-7% to of congenital heart defects and has a male to female predominance of 2 ratio 1. Narrowing is usually located in the descending aorta at the insertion site of the ductus arteriosus and result in the obstruction to blood flow and increase left ventricular afterload. Degree of narrowing determines the clinical severity. A unit with a critical coarctation, one where narrowing is so severe that ductus arteriosus is necessary to supply the systemic blood flow, may present with evidence of shock as the ductus arteriosus closes. On examination, pulses distal to the coarctation will be weak or absent, but pre-ductal pulses, for example right radial, may be preserved. Now late onset neonatal sepsis may present similarly with non-specific signs such as poor feeding, lethargy and tachypnea and can progress to shock. Dehydration may also occur commonly in this age group due to insufficient intake and can result in hypovolemic shock. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia is most commonly a result of 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Males born with this defect have no genital abnormalities and may present with poor feeding, failure to thrive, dehydration and shock. Now although physical examination findings may be similar and non-specific in all of these scenarios, but there should be no discrepancy between upper and lower extremity pulses. Transposition of the great artery is a common congenital heart defect in which aorta arises from the right ventricle and pulmonary artery from the left ventricle so that both circuits are in parallel rather than in series. Now infant with TGA typically present at birth with cyanosis rather than shock. Now question number 2. Infant is endotracheally intubated and intravenous access is obtained. Which of the following is most important diagnostic test to perform next? A. Blood culture B. Echocardiogram C. Chest X-ray D. Computed tomography of the chest E. 21 hydroxylase level And the correct answer is B. That is echocardiogram. Diagnosis of coarctation of aorta is made with echocardiogram which can be done rapidly and at bedside if possible. Echocardiogram may demonstrate narrowing in the aorta, presence or absence of ductus arteriosus, ventricular function and geometry, and presence of any associated lesion such as bicuspid aortic valve. Chest X-ray may demonstrate cardiomegaly but is typically non-diagnostic. A chest CT scan will provide diagnosis but is not necessary in this scenario. Although a blood culture may be indicated in this child, it will not provide immediate diagnosis. Question number 3. Which of the following treatment should be initiated next? A. Normal saline bolus B. Hydrocortisone C. Nitroprusite infusion 
D. Epinephrine infusion E. Prostaglandin E1 infusion And the correct answer is E. That is prostaglandin E1 infusion. Now goal of the early therapy in this scenario is reopening of the ductus arteriosus which will restore the perfusion distal to the coarctation. Ductus arteriosus is sensitive to prostaglandin. Prostaglandin E1 infusion has a very short half-life, so it must be given as a continuous intravenous infusion. In a stable infant, typical starting doses are 0.02 to 0.05 microgram per kg per minute. But in a patient in shock with a tiny or closed ductus, doses up to 0.1 microgram per kg per minute may be necessary. Now, a normal saline bolus may be indicated in this neonate who has been eating poorly and may have a degree of intravascular volume depletion. However, a fluid bolus will not restore the distal perfusion since it will have no effect on the ductus arteriosus. Similarly, with decreased left ventricular function, epinephrine infusion may also be indicated. Epinephrine is an excellent inotropic agent, but at higher doses it is associated with increased systemic vascular resistance, which may be detrimental to a failing ventricle. Epinephrine will also not improve the distal perfusion since that relies entirely on the potency of the ductus arteriosus. Nitroprusside is a vasodilating agent which is used for hypertension and for heart failure to decrease the systemic afterload. Although infant in this scenario has heart failure, the increased afterload is due to a fixed obstruction. So, administration of a vasodilator in this setting is contraindicated. Last, hydrocortisone is used in infant with glutocorticoid or mineralocorticoid deficiency, but would have no role in this setting. Question number 4. Prostaglandin E1 infusion is begun intravenously and the patient is stabilized. As you monitor the patient, which of the following is a common side effect of the treatment with prostaglandin E1 infusion? A. Dry mouth B. Apnea C. Hypotension D. Vomiting E. Rash And the correct answer is B. Most concerning side effect of the prostaglandin therapy is apnea, which occur commonly with the institution of the therapy and is dose dependent. Infants who are not intubated and ventilated prior to the start of prostaglandin infusion necessitate close monitoring and often require intubation. For this reason, when transferring a newborn on a prostaglandin infusion to a tertiary hospital, many centers will prophylactically intubate a newborn prior to the transfer. Prostaglandin may cause systemic vasodilation, but significant hypotension is uncommon. Other side effects may be reported with many drugs, but in general, prostaglandin infusion is well tolerated. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel.